director at the museum. Oh. Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our monthly Immerse Yourself presentation at the History of Diving Museum. My name is Lisa Mangili. I'm the executive director here at the museum. And today we have explorer, engineer, author, uh, Jill Heinrich, who is going to be with us into um, diving into the unknown life as a cave diver. But before we get into that, I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Cultural Culture Builds Florida, as well as David and Patty Gross. Um, this wraps up our 2021 series. Next month, we'll be starting with 2022. If it wasn't for sponsors like BPW of the Upper Keys, Dutton Law Group, Home Light, Key Dives, Silent World, the Surgery Center, Monroe County Development Council, uh, Tourism Development Council, John and Colleen Hazelbaker with Hammerhead Marine and various members and um, who have helped us over the year. If you want to be a member for 2022, please reach out to divingmuseum.org, look at the little get involved tab and um, we can help us sponsor 2022. Would like to welcome everybody to again to our presentation tonight. If you haven't been down to the museum, we are open daily from 10 to 5. We're located in Isla Morada, right in the middle of the beautiful Florida Keys. And again, you can find out more information on divingmuseum.org. If you're watching tonight, please put in the chat column. Um, let us know where you're from and how many people are with you. If you're watching this on the recorded YouTube channel, then make a comment and we'll check those and get back to us, uh, get back to you. If you have any questions, put it in the chat or again, put it in our YouTube as a comment and somebody will uh, be getting back with you. So on all of our technology. Um, we are going to have everybody muted except for our speaker and our moderator, Yael, um, and we will be turning your cameras off. So the program tonight will be recorded. And now I'd like to go on to our program. Um, again, we have Jill Heiner. She is an author. She's an explorer. She's an inspiration. Um, she's She's definitely braver than um, most people I know, and I really look forward to finding out more about her life as a cave diver and diving into the unknown. So Yael, if you will put us together and uh, welcome Jill to our presentation tonight. All right. Uh, well, thanks everybody for uh, inviting me tonight. It's great to be here with you. I'm just going to share my screen uh, so that you'll be able to see my presentation. And uh, I think you might see me in the corner, but uh, but if not, then I trust that you're all there and we'll have time to chat afterwards. <laughs> um, tonight, I'm going to share with you a little bit about uh, my life as a cave diver and some of the experiences that I've had. I am uh, phoning in here from uh, Canada. I'm in Nova Scotia right now. It's been uh, quite a busy month for me. In fact, uh, I guess my month started with um, some research work out in the St. Lawrence River and uh, pretty, pretty chilly there doing some redfish uh, research work with the uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And then I went from that uh, near freezing water straight down to Florida <laughs> to do some uh, cave diving um, and some speaking actually but uh, photographing in the caves of, of North Florida. Uh, for those of you that aren't cave divers, these are um, sort of northwest of Gainesville, Florida. Um, beautiful, beautiful places. And, and now I'm back up in uh, Nova Scotia at a pretty interesting uh, facility um, doing uh, some training. Actually, I'm a student uh, this, this week, uh, as opposed to an instructor this week, just... Um, keeping some of my uh, boating survival and emergency skills fresh. And they have an awesome facility here, like a, a 18 foot deep pool that can generate six foot waves, 60 mile per hour winds um, and rain, thunder, lightning, sound. Um, so you really feel like you're out in the open ocean when you're uh, in a survival suit, climbing into a lifeboat and things like that. It's quite fun. 
So as you'll see from this presentation, I do quite a variety of work, but most of the time you will find me carrying along an underwater camera, either a stills camera or a video camera, sometimes shooting for television programs, sometimes um, shooting for scientific research and documentation. But my happy place is indeed caves all over the world. Caves, and, and I would say, probably equal interest in a lot of my work in the polar regions. This is in the Canadian Arctic, um, literally on the frozen Northwest Passage. So this would be uh, an iceberg that's come all the way from Greenland and is frozen into the sea ice uh, near uh, between Baffin Island and Bylot Island in the Canadian Arctic. Um, but although I'm from Canada, not everything I do is in cold water. I go to some pretty unusual places to um, find dive sites like this one, which is literally uh, in Egypt, uh, very close to the Libyan border. Uh, pretty uh, interesting spot where I led a, an expedition for National Geographic. But caves to me are really more beautiful than any other place that I, I get to go and the source of incredible scientific discoveries. Now, most people think about just blackness when they think about underwater cave systems. And oh, let me see, can we see this now? Oh, there we go, sorry. I, need to trigger that. There we go. Yeah, most people think about blackness when they think about underwater cave systems, but there is so much more to underwater caves. These are places where I can extend the eyes and hands of scientists who are doing all sorts of research in these amazing places. For instance, um, interest in paleoclimatology, scientists who are interested in studying the geology and learning about Earth's past climates. Uh, there are scientists who are interested in the living things within underwater caves. Um, others are interested in the archaeological remains because caves are kind of like portals to another world. These are places where ancient civilizations um, thought of caves as portals to another world and they left behind cultural assets and remains that we discover today. Some spaces are really small in underwater cave systems and some are huge. So these vast spaces can be so big that I can't even see the walls, the floor, the ceiling for reference. Um, and I think you'll agree that many of these places are incredibly beautiful, you know, giving me a chance with my camera to document places that nobody has ever been before and perhaps nobody else will return to. So it is an incredible privilege for me to call these caves really literally my office, my workplace all around the world. Now, um, caves are also found in the ice. And, you know, many of these places like Iceberg Caves, for instance, are um, represent, you know, great challenges, like to do things that have never even been done before. Like this is inside a cave in Antarctica and nobody had ever been cave diving inside an iceberg before um, my colleagues and I decided to, to take on the challenge. Uh, a lot of what I do requires a lot of gear. Um, more often than not um, for expeditionary work, I'll, I'll be in a rebreather. Uh, so a, a device that's sort of closer to a spacesuit than traditional scuba, something that allows me to recirculate exhaled breath, scrub it clean of carbon dioxide, and uh, recirculate it back with small injections of oxygen to uh, m make up what my body has metabolized. So with a device like this, I can go deeper or further into the planet. Um, really, it extends my range on, on my exploration work. But as I'm using a rebreather, a life support device, and I'm operating a camera, that means I have to balance that, you know, left brain, right brain. Like I need to come home with the most creative and beautiful images that I can come up with. But I also need to not lose track of taking care of my life support and constantly being vigilant about knowing what my PO2 is when I'm underwater. So it's a real balance. It's a real task load that can um, certainly sort of take me to the edge of, of what is possible. 
But for me, caves are worthy of exploration. These are incredible places that offer you know, so much for us to, to study and learn about. And caves are also the pipeline, the conduit that carries fresh water through the planet. Not all caves are freshwater, uh, but many, many caves are, are carrying the actual groundwater that's being drawn up from wells to your home, your industry, or to, you know, put water on the, uh, the farmer's fields. So swimming through these places, I, I recognize I'm kind of a canary in the coal mine, and I get to see the state of the health of the planet swimming through the veins of Mother Earth, literally in the sustenance of the planet. And I think that's one of the most important things to learn about in the next generation. It's, it's important to know where our drinking water comes from, how we might be polluting it or unintentionally overusing it, how we can conserve it for the next generation. Now, back to the scientists that I work with. Some of the scientists I work with are interested in the life within underwater caves, and, and I'm really interested in speleobiology, cave biology as well. And other people like, um, in fact, uh, astrobiologists are interested in what lives in underwater caves too, because it's a different sort of life than we see in other places on earth. And we can perhaps learn from things in caves about what we might find on other planets, for instance. So in caves, there's a lot of life, um, small stuff in general, um, but animals, that spend their entire life cycle inside an underwater cave. They're called troglobites. They'll never come out, never see the light of day. We have cave visitors too, troglozines, animals that come and go from the cave system. But troglobites are cool because they have evolved and changed in order to adapt to the environment. So this cave adapted fish, for instance, doesn't have any eyes. It has very little pigment, as you can see. Um, and it's very, very long lived, living in a very food scarce environment. But we also have crustaceans, things that look similar to shrimp, lobster, crabs and things, except they also have no eyes and no pigment. And many of these are also very long lived, like the pallid crayfish in North Florida lives for about 200 years. That's, that's quite remarkable. And they have some pretty cool survival mechanisms too. So this animal is called remipede and remipede has venomous fangs and pincers and it can latch onto something that it wants to eat. It can inject it with venom, turn its guts into jello and then suck the life out of it over time. And if this guy was the size of a cat, it would be the deadliest thing on earth. So kind of a cool animal. Kids love this animal. <laughs> It's a cave monster, but only miniature. So um, I think they're just fascinating. And I think that these animals can teach us a lot about evolution and survival. I mean, imagine that pallid crayfish I was telling you about that can live 200 years. He has a very close relative that lives only a few meters away in the open water of a river. But that crayfish has eyes and has pigment. Um, and yet it'll only live for two to three years compared to 200 years. And many of these animals are also like living swimming dinosaurs because remipede, for example, hasn't evolved in over 65 million years. So he predates the extinction of the dinosaurs. We find him in the fossil records, 65 million years old, and we find the animals swimming in the caves today. Now, recently, I've been doing some pretty interesting um, biology exploration in Canada. In fact, in Canada's longest underwater cave system, and it's near where I, where I live in Ottawa. And so the slowdown for COVID gave me some time to do a lot more exploration in this cave, which is currently mapped over six miles of passages. Now, this photograph shows you the best visibility I have ever seen in my cave there in Ottawa. Normally the visibility is two feet, maybe three feet. So this day was absolutely exceptional. And a lot of people ask me why on earth would you wanna go into a near freezing, extraordinarily high flow, no visibility, small grinding cave system. One, it's what I have where I live. 
<laughs> and two, it's full of life. In fact, I've never seen the density of life that I see in this cave um, anywhere else on earth. And that's amazing. Like what you see in this picture um, hanging from the ceiling, this is actually made by insect larva. This is um, made by the caddis fly insect. So the caddis fly at a larval stage begins its life underwater. And it makes these like mucusoid sort of webs that it hangs everywhere. And the flow actually delivers food into these webs, kind of the way a plankton net um, collects plankton. Now, sometimes I go into the cave and you might know that cave divers follow a safety line through the cave. So we lay a guideline through the cave system so that if we can't see when we come out, we can put our hand around a guideline loosely and follow it all the way to the open water. Well, sometimes I go into the cave and the trichoptera have made these nets all over my lines. And it kind of looks like, like snotty, dirty socks, right? <laughs> but amazing. Also in this cave, there's an abundance of freshwater mussels and mussels perform a really important ecosystem service by filtering the water of contamination, not just um, like, you know, dirty things, but, but even um, harmful chemicals, um, they can actually filter out of the, the water column. And when I first saw how many millions of freshwater mussels there were in the cave, I thought, wow. And I soon learned after collaborating with a, uh, with a local scientist who specializes in uh, freshwater mussels, that this, this was something very special because I found endangered species, um, both endangered fish and endangered mussels living in this cave environment. And nobody's ever documented that or written it before in any scientific journals. Now, what's cool about freshwater mussels that you might not know about is they're quite different from the mussels, marine mussels. They need a fish. They need a fish host to live. So here's how that works. A male mussel spits sperm out into the water column and it's very high flow in this cave system. And so that gets quickly delivered to a female mussel who takes those in and develops um, embryos or larvae. They're called glochidia. And while she's developing those, she's also growing a fishing lure. So she grows a piece of flesh hanging out of her own shell. And remember, a muscle doesn't have a brain and it doesn't have eyes, but she builds a beautiful minnow-like lure to attract a specific species of fish, much in the way a fishing lure generally works better for one fish and not for another. So in the case of my endangered, you know, hickory nut mussels, sturgeons are attracted to the mussels. There's also another mussel called Lampsilus cardium and bass and a couple of other species are attracted to the lures that she makes. So when the fish nips at the lure and that female mussel actually vibrates the lure in the water column, like jigging, the fish bites at it. She spits out little baby hinged shells, glochidia, at the fish, also mucus. So the fish has nipped at it and then it passes through its mouth. It ends up stuck in the gills or sometimes on the fins of the fish. And those little baby muscles latch on, they clamp on and they insist in the fish's gills. And they steal blood serum for days, weeks, or months before the young fish's immune system kicks out the glochidia. They bury themselves in the bottom for a couple of years before re-emerging again. That's an incredible life cycle. Like sturgeon are endangered, hickory nut mussels are endangered, but they gotta find each other. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. Now we actually go out into the river outside the cave and we catch fish and we take little DNA samples from the fish, but we also look in their gills. So um, many different species of fish will look at like walleye and pike and pickerel, uh, you know, many different fish. In this case, this is a sturgeon, and we're opening it up and using a hand lens to look at the gills. And when we look into the gills, we can find the glochidia insisting on the gills themselves, so we can see them. Uh, and so we know that the reproductive cycle is happening still, because like I see mussels in the cave that are 80 years old, 
but I haven't done a quantifiable um, study of like how many juvenile muscles there are in, in, in estimation. And we want to see lots of juvenile muscles because we want to see the population continuing to grow. So this slide, you're actually seeing microscopic larval glochidia. And then on the little yellow dots you're seeing are actually the glochidia insisting on the gills. And so there, you can actually see them you know, robbing that blood serum from the fish. This is a picture of the lure of the Lampsilus cardium in the cave. So it looks just like a fish laying on top of that shell. It's quite beautiful. Um, and that female muscle will flick it in such a way to attract a fish. So I, I think that's just absolutely fascinating, you know, that, that both species can still, you know, survive this relationship. Uh, some caves where we find a lot of life are ankyaline caves. Those are caves that integrate both freshwater and saltwater. So imagine starting inland and swimming through a cave system and ending out in the sea. You'll start in freshwater and end up in saltwater. And some of that transitional zone and the saltwater zone are, are pretty full of life. But for pure freshwater cave system like my Ottawa River cave, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, caves like this one in, in um, Bermuda, sometimes you don't see the life really. I mean, it's a beautiful, you know, geologic, you know, wonderland kind of thing, but so much of the life is small stuff swimming around. But these cave systems are, are stunningly, stunningly beautiful. So the chance to document these places is, is quite remarkable. This is a cave in the Bahamas called Dan's Cave. And uh, we've done quite a lot of work here with climate scientists who are interested in the, the geology of the caves. Now, you might notice that with all these formations that um, this cave was formed at a time when the cave was dry. So ocean levels were lower, water tables were lower, and then literally rainwater soaked down through the soils, dripped from the ceiling to the floor, and these formations built up over time. And then later in geologic time, the water table came up, the ocean level came up, and the cave is full of water. And this cave is particularly interesting, one, because it's beautiful, but two, because it's had several dry and wet phases in its history. And so we have kind of formations on top of formations on top of formations, and, um, and that makes it quite different. Now, the physicists that are interested in this cave are interested in the red and orange material that you see in this photograph, because this cave is in the Bahamas, if you'll remember, but that orange material, that red material is from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. It's from the Sahara Desert. And I know you're thinking, how on earth <laughs> does material from the Sahara Desert end up underground, underwater, in the Bahamas. And I think it's a pretty cool story. So imagine like this material is trapped inside the rocks. So it's been actually able to soak down through the ground, drip from the ceiling to the floor. And then later other things have dripped from the ceiling to the floor, trapping that stuff inside. So think of it like like dripping candle wax piling up over time, but think of it as different colors of candles piled on top of each other. And the Sahara dust is, is remarkable because of its color, because it's different than anything we see in the cave. Everything else is you know, very white and creamy looking, but the Sahara dust is a really fine sediment. And we still have Sahara dust storms today. So, um, Certainly during dry epochs on planet Earth, these would have been much more cataclysmic storms delivering a lot more material. But even in you know, June of 2020, um, we had a reasonably significant Sahara dust event bring the dust all the way across, deposited on the Bahamas and, and even on um, coastal Central America and even parts of Florida, uh, but in small quantities. So uh, this is my partner, Brian K. Cook. He's um, using a very expensive scientific device to sample some of that dust from between calcite layers as a turkey baster from my kitchen. <laughs> One of the most useful scientific tools in the field. <laughs> uh, but you can see there's quite a thick layer of that, of that material there. 
So sometimes we see it like inside the calcite and you hold up a flashlight to a beautiful crystalline formation and you can see it glow orange and red. And so um, Peter Swart, uh, Dr. Peter Swart from University of Miami asked us to bring out some specific formations, like literally swim a sledgehammer into the cave, knock down a formation, tie it up with a lift bag and swim it out of the cave so that he could slice it open. And when slicing it open, he can look at the layers of deposition and count back in time. And he's dated this particular cave over 350,000 years and four separate dry epochs. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, counting the tree rings on a felled tree or, or looking at you know, like ice core layers over time um, to really get a sense of age. Now, um, there's other places where scientists are interested in, in um, climate evidence, like off of Bermuda, for instance, in, um, well, I guess 10 years ago now, we did the deepest dives, manned dives in Bermuda's history off the Bermuda Bank and the Argus and Challenger Seamounts um, down to about 460 feet deep, looking for caves, looking for animals, but also looking for um, what are called sea level notches. So places where we have direct evidence of waves crashing on the shore. Um, so um, we use the rebreathers for these, these uh, deep, deep dives um, and a team of volunteer assistance to uh, help us through the deco portion anyway. Um, but when we land down on these, these uh, ledges, this is a sea level notch. So the ocean waves would have hit this at sea level um, at another time in you know, Earth's history. This is now 370 feet below the surface, this particular ledge. And that's where the sea level stand used to be. And we bring back rocks and um, live specimens for um, scientists from the um, Natural History Museum in Bermuda to, to look at. Um, on this particular project, you know, weeks after um, bringing some of the samples to geologists, one of the geologists let us know that, that after weeks of having these rocks sitting in his office in a tank, that a small octopus crawled out of, of one of our samples, which was kind of cool. Uh, other scientists that I work with include paleontologists, archaeologists who are interested in, um, you know, cultural assets that we find, old bones that we find in, in caves underwater. And uh, we do that work, a lot of it in Central America, but other places as well. Uh, Mexico, Cuba, um, the Bahamas, uh, Belize, places like that. Uh, and many of these places look something similar to this. So this is a cave that's in the middle of the Yucatan Peninsula. It's due south of Merida. And um, this is a cenote. It's a little bit different than the ones you might have seen on the coast in uh, the Riviera Maya, uh, because this one, the water table is lower. So we actually rappel down to the water um, to reach the water. And what you're actually looking at is the underside or the inside of a drinking water well. So the stripe down the center of the photo is a pipe. And there's literally a guy on top of the bright light on that photo above ground, pumping a pump handle up and down to bring fresh water up from below. And the archeologists are interested in that mountain of debris that you see at the bottom of the picture. Um, that mountain representing everything that's fallen from the ceiling or down through that hole over time. So um, as we go down, I, I actually likened this place, I called it the well of time, because it seemed like the further we went down that mountain of debris, it was like the further back we were going in history. I mean, it was really, really fascinating. So this is in Mexico, but, but we're also working in other places like, like in Cuba, um, just north of the north side of the Zapata swamp, there's quite a lot of caves there. Um, in this case, we're actually in the bush, um, sort of uh, working with local families um, that live on the land. We're going into dry cave systems to go dry caving through the system until we reach the water. And then at, when we reach the water, go underwater from there. And we still find, you know, cultural assets and bones in these sorts of places as well. Um, 
in the past, we would, you know, go underwater, find something significant, and then manually document it. So you'll see our cave line here in this photo, and you'll see a little triangle on the cave line with some writing on it. That's a, a, a tactile marker that tells you which way is out of the cave or to the nearest exit. Um, there's also some information written on there about the survey station. Um, there's a couple of markers in that spot because uh, what my partner's looking at here is an extinct sloth. So the bones of an extinct sloth. So traditionally we would find something like this. We would put a scale down. And for me as an artist, like I would start drawing or sketching what we've got so we can tell the archeologists about it. Now for mapping, we would run that line through the cave system, put markers on it and measure distances with fiberglass tape and draw the cave as we go. So this cave system in Cuba, it's all hand surveyed with a compass and string basically. And as you can imagine, that takes a long time. Um, a lot of this cartography, it was done by a group of us, but um, Bill Phillips was the key cartographer here. And he is, he's so good. He's so accurate. And he was so fast at drawing um, this sort of, this sort of stuff. Unfortunately, Bill's not with us any, any longer, but what a talented cartographer he was. So, you know, Bill might be doing map survey and I might be sketching out what I'm seeing on a sloth skull or something. And then I take that back to the scientist and the scientist says, yeah, that's the skull of a sloth, but I need to see the teeth. I need to know, like, what are the details of the bite marks on the teeth? Um, and so we might go back in and do more sketching and try and give him a better idea or take photographs. But today we do something that's even more exciting. We actually scan these objects in place. So we don't touch them. We take a whole bunch of pictures and do photogrammetry in order to display in exquisite detail, like 80,000 data points per square inch, the representation of this, this bone that we can now leave underwater and not have to worry about how it's going to get conserved. So uh, we also do a lot of interesting imaging of the spaces inside the cave as well. Sometimes with familiar, or familiar looking things like GoPros, this is actually a 360 setup that my partner Corey Jaskowski built with, with 16 GoPros all running simultaneously to create 360 footage. Uh, but with Corey, we, you know, we're doing a lot more advanced technology now. Corey and I will, um, you know, rappel down into a cenote, uh, land in the water. Uh, we're working here with uh, archaeologists uh, like Guillermo Dianda um, from Ina in Mexico. And when we have an object that we want to, to image, we'll take a whole bunch of pictures that are then, you know, seamed together into a beautiful, um, accurate uh, representation of the object itself. And that might be like a pot like this one, or it could be even human remains. And um, here you're actually seeing stages of a scan. Um, so these are not photographs. Um, these are sta stages of a scan in um, progression. So not only can we image the object and we don't have to worry about removal, damage or conservation issues, um, it feels a lot better, certainly, to not disturb someone's ceremonial burial and leave everything untouched. But we can also get so much more information to the scientist by scanning and imaging an entire area. And we can show them, here's the skull, here's a pot, here's some other stuff, we don't know what this is, here's some of the other bones, here's some wood. Um, and they can study this in so much more detail we can also give them uh, a, a representation that they can now move in, in, in 3D, basically look at everything in 360 from different angles and get a lot more information um, that way. Now, the detail is also sort of better than the object itself in a way. So this is a scan of a human skull and you're looking at the blunt force trauma where this poor guy probably got hit over the head with a club before he was sacrificed in the cenote. And not only can we offer them the data like on a computer to rotate around in 360, but we can make holograms too. 
So this is a few years ago, but this was a beta level um, Microsoft HoloLens. And if you're wearing the HoloLens and we're looking through it, this is the view that you would get. So this is Guillermo, the archeologist and behind him is the real cave. So these are, you know, real things, real cave, real situation, real archeologist. But now you can see a saber tooth bear skull semi-transparent on a table. So wherever you look, you'll see the holographic object, but you'll see the real things around you as well. Kind of like Pokemon go on steroids. And if many people are wearing Microsoft HoloLenses, you would each see it from your own angle. And the wearer, whoever's sort of in charge of the menu system can use their fingers to um, like swap it out with other objects that we've, we've set on our holographic table. So we can move the skull up onto the top of the table just with a movement of our finger. Uh, we can also rotate objects and look closely at them. And this is, this is really just the beginning. I mean, Corey Jaskolski has um, image places like Machu Picchu, Everest Base Camp, um, you know, uh, sacred ruins in, in Jordan. So we're far beyond objects now into imaging entire environments that can be experienced holographically. And that's powerful for science and education. But it's also powerful to be able to share with um, our indigenous guides, for instance, that generously invite us to their land to, to look at what's in these caves. Like the man that's wearing the hollow lens here, I mean, very likely the things that we're showing him are the remains of his ancestors. So being able to participate in that is important. So there are still times when we're asked to bring up particular objects. Like in this case, this is a sextant from uh, a shipwreck in Canada that was significant. And it took two years to get a permit to be allowed to bring up the sextant so that it could be conserved at a museum um, and put on display. The reason why we thought this was a, a vulnerable asset that should be brought up is because it's getting dived a lot more, this shipwreck, and we were afraid that it would disappear. Um, so in order to avoid it being pilfered, <laughs> we wanted to make sure it got protected. So this is a sextant from a shipwreck that was sunk in 1942 by uh, German U-boats. Um, there are four wrecks in this area that were all sunk by German U-boats, and they were all carrying a very high grade of iron ore that was fairly critical to the shipbuilding efforts in, in the war. And the Nazis thought that if they sunk these ore carriers and destroyed, you know, the loading wharf at the mine itself, that they might be able to sort of change the tide of the war. So these wrecks are war graves. Uh, we're working towards them being an actual, you know, historic monument in, in Canada, but they're also incredible artificial reefs um, that are being changed every year by ice that passes over in the winter time because they're shallow enough that um, icebergs will impact them every year. So documenting them and, and conserving, you know, what we can is important. And as I said before, I love diving the ice too. So, <laughs> so uh, when I'm out uh, east in Newfoundland, I try to go early enough in the season that I get a chance to do some iceberg, uh, iceberg diving as well, uh, which, is, which is quite, quite fun. But also in um, Newfoundland, we dive the actual mine itself that the iron ore came from. Um, and these mines, now you, you walk down about, uh, 650 feet down the slope to get to the point where the water has flooded the uh, the mine and it's 1800 feet deep covering nine square miles so there's a lifetime of cave exploration to do here these are some of the most oldest entrances at the waterline this is some of the tailing piles inland and here we are flying a drone right into one of the uh, entrances to uh, to the mine. So today tourists can actually visit the dry part of this mine and walk down the 650 feet slope and see where, where we start our dives. Um, but these mines are, are absolutely fascinating because the machinery, the equipment, the remains, um, personal artifacts from the miners themselves are left behind. We've also used this as a place to do some interesting Dan research on, um, you know, 
cold water long duration decompression dives and how that's uh, caused decompression stress. Um, but yeah, the miners left behind personal artifacts. They inscribed things on the walls, um, like they did caricatures, they did counts for um, figuring out their loads for the day. There's a stable underwater, tool rooms, lunch rooms, like escape places. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting. And it's just like a very squared off cave system. Uh, one of my partners that I've dived here with a fair bit is also an engineer from the oil and gas industry. And so he understands all the machinery, the pumps and things that we're seeing underwater and, uh, you know, helps me to understand how the whole mine would have been at one point dewatered so the miners could do, do their work. Um, it's really an interesting place and it has life too. So there's now, you know, sulfur oxidizing bacterial colonies, all kinds of, uh, of interesting things. When a miner lost his life in the course of his work in a place like this, they often put a cross on the wall, a little right white painted cross. And there are 107 white painted crosses in um, this mine. And we can see the places where men lost their lives in rock falls, getting run over by ore carts or, or other uh, incidents during their very dangerous uh, work times in these spaces. Um, but fascinating. It's about um, on average 34 to 37 degree water here, um, but pretty interesting place to, uh, to dive. Uh, now, my favorite uh, place of, of, or my favorite expedition of all is this one. Um, this was the Wakala Project more than, well, gosh, it's 25 years ago now, where we made the first ever three-dimensional map of any subterranean space, dry or wet. This is Wakala Springs in North Florida. Uh, interestingly, the site of where Creature from the Black Lagoon was filmed and Airport and uh, the Tarzan movies. But we set up an amazing infrastructure to be able to do dives that had never even been, you know, thought about before. Um, to give you a sense of, of these dives, we were um, doing five hour bottom time at 300 feet, followed by 17 or more hours of decompression. Some of that decompression was able to be completed in a pressurized habitat in order to shorten our time underwater. But this was back 1997, 98, and we were using dual rebreathers and um, the most um, innovative scooters that had ever been uh, made to date. So by the time I would go off on a mission here, I would be driving a mapper or a scooter, dragging another one, wearing a couple of rebreathers, carrying, you know, four, five, six extra tanks and a scientific diving package. Um, so, you know, four 500 pounds of equipment on missions up to, you know, 22 hours long. And um, we were gathering sonar data that was later seamed all together into um, a, a three-dimensional representation with accuracy that we also registered to the top side topography. So a radio tracking team literally was walking over the surface of the earth and listening for a ping from us underground and knowing exactly where our position was. Today, that technology has shrunk and uh, gotten cheaper. And we even take it to the Bahamas to put in the hands of school kids who can then track the cave beneath their feet. And in this case, we put the marker underneath the porta potty <laughs> in a cave system underneath the porta potty. So the kids were trying to track us in the cave and they would discover that we were beneath the porta potty um, in this beautiful cave system underneath their feet. But when you can take what is otherwise to a non cave diver, something that's very abstract and help people to understand that water flows beneath your feet and that water is the very matrix that knits us all together then suddenly they start to understand like interconnectivity on the planet. Like, like I said, I'm swimming through the veins of mother earth and water knows no international boundaries. So, so something that happens on the other side of the planet in a water system can affect us all. And, and I think we all get that now that we've experienced COVID. I mean, 
you could take all the COVID virus in the whole planet that ever was, and you can hold it all in your hand. It'd be smaller than the size of a baseball. But that pile of virus has affected every human on planet Earth. And water is no different. So water moves around the planet. And if we contaminate it in another part of the world, we're going to live with the consequences in this part of the world. So that everything that we do on the surface of the Earth gets returned to us to drink. That's why I think this project was so consequential in my life, because it changed me. It changed my thinking, my connection with, with water on the planet. It really helped me to understand that my value as a cave diver could contribute to scientific discoveries that would help us to better understand that water planet and everything that swims through it. And that mapping device that was born back in 1997 has continued to be developed. And now it's a fully autonomous, artificially intelligent robot cave mapping device that no longer needs me to swim through the planet. It can go on its own. So Bill Stone, the developer of both the rebreathers, the mapper that we used back in Wakulla, has continued to develop sunfish to the point where it can now be sent off the edge of a boat off into the water and told to go fetch cave and it can swim into the cave system without us now, map the cave and bring back the three-dimensional data for us. Now that's great for exploration on earth, but it's also great for exploration beyond. I mean, it's natural for us to want to explore our planet and explore our watery places but we're certainly interested in off-Earth exploration. So teaching sunfish to explore is going to allow it to go out into outer space without us. It's gonna to go to Jupiter's moon Europa beneath the frozen surface and map the liquid ocean there and send us back the telemetry on Earth. So to be a part of a project like that, that's taken so long to germinate and grow, um, it's still, it's extraordinary. And to think that, you know, I may never get a chance to be an astronaut, but something that I touched and had, you know, a little small piece of, you know, documenting and develop, developing will maybe unravel the secrets of outer space. I mean, we look for water on earth to understand life. We're looking for water in space to understand, um, you know, the astrobiology that we might find there. So for me, a little girl that kind of wanted to be an astronaut, this is the next best thing. Well, maybe it's even better, in fact, because I've had a chance to go to so many remarkable dark places on this earth and, uh, and contribute to science. So I think um, this is probably a really good place to open it up for some questions through the chat. Uh, but before I do, I just want to say, you know, thank you for inviting me and, and thank you to all the sponsors that, that uh, support your museum as well, because, uh, because it's an educational opportunity for so many people. And, and I want to thank my, um, my sponsors. There's many manufacturers that support me with equipment and make it possible for me to, um, to continue to do what I do with the best and safest gear. And I always appreciate them. So I'll stop my share and I'll try to well, stop uh, my share. Yael is putting a list of questions together. Um, I would yeah. like to thank you for the wonderful presentation. And, you know, I, I, I didn't mention when I introduced you that you're in the Women Diving Hall of Fame, you're yeah. in the Scuba Diving Hall of Fame, you're an explorer. I think you're the only female in the Royal Canadian Explorers. Uh, well, I'm the explorer, the first explorer in residence for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah. it's it's just amazing, and and the discipline for each one of these expeditions, whether you're looking for the archaeology or the scientific um, organisms that you see, or being the first one, you have to learn that discipline in each yeah. environment that you're going into. I mean, it's just remarkable, and I will promote. Your book, oh, which thank we you. sell at the museum, <laughs> um, Into the Planet is phenomenal. Whether you buy the hard copy here, whether you get it um, on the audio, I love that you actually narrate it because <laughs> you can, the enthusiasm just comes through your voice of, and the fear. There's part of a few that, tears. <laughs> yeah. through. 
and um, and also um, the Aquanaut because we get a lot of um, kids and divers and you know they're just uh, phenomenal books. Thank so you. thank you, thank you very much. So Yael, you have a, a great list. Uh, read them off. Um, right. Yeah. So. I think I can speak for everyone when we say our minds are kind of blown by all of this. So I'm gonna to try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, so I'll start with one about, you were talking about kind of working with cartographers and working with an artist and working with scientists. Um, and it seems like that's forming connections across a lot of different fields. And so I think there's like a two part question in there of um, how do you make sure that you're communicating well in an interdisciplinary way when these different fields have such different languages that they use? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then also, how do you find the people to do this with? How do you network um, to make these things possible to bring together this really interdisciplinary team? Yeah, I mean, multidisciplinary collaborations, I think, are, are the future. So is fast science. Like, we don't have time for, for traditional um, methodologies in in scientific you know research and publication for some of the issues that we face on this planet today so we need a lot of citizen scientists we need a lot of multidisciplinary thinkers to to work together to solve very big problems and to be brave with their ideas and their imagination and throw it out there even if someone goes well that's dumb <laughs> um so i guess i have this unabashed like like where I'm brave is, is walking up to someone and saying, how can I help? <laughs> That's where I'm brave. Um, so I like to volunteer. I like to learn. I mean, here I am. I'm a student this week again. Um, it's important to keep learning. And I, I tell people I have an advanced degree in curiosity. <laughs> and, and that's what's opened many, many doors. Because I think that many people looking at careers in the future, they're not going to go to school and specialize in something for the rest of their life and work for one entity for the rest of their life. They're probably going to be mobile, multidisciplinary collaborate, collaborators, and they're going to have to be um, fluent in many literacies and, and be willing to hit the internet, do their research, and um, join a team. But everything that I do today started by volunteering first and asking for the gig. How can I help? Very powerful words. Um, so you talked a little bit in that last answer that kind of plugs into a different question about how we don't really have a lot of time. So the science we need to do is fast. And yeah. there's a question in the chat about um, what's different right now about sea level changes about the things that we're facing than yeah. maybe historic sea level changes or ways that things have changed in the past that make it more Urgent right now? Well, it's incredibly urgent because we've never seen the magnitude and, and speed of change that we're seeing now in terms of, you know, rising temperatures and rising CO2 levels. Um, and it's, it's fact, like, like, I still get people who say, so do you believe in climate change? I'm like, it's not a question of belief. <laughs> it's a question of science. Um, yeah, so things are happening very, very quickly. I should not have seen the change that I've seen in my life. I mean, I'm just turning 57 right now. And the changes that I've seen in the ocean and the freshwater environments and the ice in the north, it's shocking to me. And yet people that are older than me say, oh my gosh, well, you should have seen the Florida Keys, you know, 20 years before you were born. Um, so the, the magnitude of change is, is remarkable. Um, and that's why I think this whole fast science and citizen science and observation and collaboration and publicly accessible databases, they're so important. You know, when we look at global climate change and water issues, these are huge problems. It can be overwhelming. Climate grief is real. It can be terrifying to a young person to look at the world ahead. But it's just like getting out of a cave. When everything goes wrong, when you're trapped, you can't see, you've got a broken line, your buddy's panicking, everything's going wrong. You can't focus on the big thing about like what it looks like outside that cave. You must focus on what you can control. And that's the immediate stuff. It's that little square foot around you that you can control right now. And all you have to say to yourself is what's the next best thing that I can do to move forward towards success? And so when something seems way too big to imagine, even if it's like a good problem, like I want to be a brain surgeon when I grow up, that seems like way too much. But what's the next best thing you can do? You can get good grades. You can 
read about brain surgeons on the internet, you can make small steps. And I have to believe that if all of us in humanity keep making those small steps, that's where we have the big revelations that solve the big problems. Yeah, that's a beautiful and optimistic vision without not being realistic. I think. <laughs> um, so this question is a little bit more specific about when you are diving. So when you have dives with really long deco time that lasts over 10 hours, do you eat? Do you drink? How do you do yeah. that underwater? Yeah, those are those are some of the most common questions, you know, like, how do you pee? What do you do? You know, yeah. how do you eat? <laughs> um, yeah, so um, there are like there are contraptions that both men and women can install into dry suits in order to pee. Uh, but when it comes down to some of this stuff, the, the basic diapers are, are a lot easier for, for that end. <laughs> um, in terms of food, we can eat underwater. So I like chocolate milk drinking boxes. Um, those are quite fun. Uh, but you can eat, you know, a chocolate bar too. If you take small bites, remembering that you have to breathe in between the chew. But here's a little interesting thing on that, on the Wakala project, some of the decompression we did was in a, a dry habitat. So we were brought to the surface pressurized and locked into a recompression chamber. And I had a birthday <laughs> in the recompression chamber. And um, so the team thought, oh, we've got to send Jill a birthday cake. Of course, they can't send candles in there because you can't have flame and a high oxygen <laughs> partial pressure, but they sent me in a birthday cake and a Burger King milkshake. And I was at about uh, uh, two atmospheres of pressure. And that meant that the cake came in squished and the milkshake came in half empty because it was squished too. And here's the other thing, under pressure, your taste buds don't work right. And so nothing quite tastes right. The texture's wrong because it's squished, but it doesn't taste very good either. Like it's just very uninteresting in a chamber. <laughs> I feel like comparing tastes would be something you could do with astronauts also. Cause I feel yeah. like a lot yeah, high about altitude don't, like don't taste very good either. Yeah. 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 Um, so we have another question of like, what are your main go-to tips to not panic underwater in a dangerous situation? Great question. And this works for dry land or underwater. Anytime something startles you, frightens you, natural human things happen. Your heart races, your respirations speed up, your mind explodes into what I call chattering monkeys. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you're thinking of a million things at once. So you take a very deep breath, same way free divers do all the way down into your hips, all the way up into your neck. And as you're doing that, say to yourself, emotions, you will not serve me well right now. So emotions go away. And then you just focus on those small pragmatic steps, but it takes that deep breath, that pause in order for you to send away the emotions. Later, after you're safe and everything's over, you can bring the emotions back in, cry about it and process it. Um, but in the moment, they're not gonna help you because they make your heart go fast and they make you breathe fast and that's not good. Um, so I think we have time for one more question before we say goodbye. Um, and so maybe we can look towards the future a little bit and what sure. would you like dream about exploring next? Where do you dream of going that you haven't been yet? Um, wow. You know, I pinch myself every day because I get to do things that I love every day. I mean, in, in the ultimate sense, if I could go to space and see this blue planet from, from, you know, that perspective, that would be amazing to me. Uh, but here on earth, I have a feeling I'm going to be doing a lot more concentrated expeditions and explorations closer to home. I mean, I think, um, I think I'm really going to have to assess, you know, my carbon impacts really, and, and do a lot more close to home because there's a lifetime of stuff to do in my backyard. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you again so much for joining us. I know that there are a lot of questions we didn't get to, but I want to personally encourage everyone to go read Into the Planet because you might get some answers there and it's an incredible mm -hmm. book. Um, and I just want to say thank you again for really blowing our minds and talking about 200 oh. year old animals and just the future <laughs> of space exploration in one talk. So we're going to head over to Lisa yeah. for a final goodbye. Thanks, Yael. And if I did miss anyone's questions, you can always reach out to me at intotheplanet.com too. So appreciate it. Great. Well, we've had, we have people from all over the United States, Minnesota, Colorado, Maine, 
South Carolina, um, all over Florida, Clearwater, Cocoa Beach, Naples, and a lot of people from here in the Keys. So again, thank you to our sponsors tonight, uh, David and Patty Gross. Patty is also in the Women's Diving Hall of Fame and a, uh, a friend of yours, Jill. And yes. um, I invite everybody um, next, next month to join us for the Immerse Yourself on the third Wednesday of the month with Captain Laurel Seaborn. Um, and she'll be talking about uh, sirens and pirates and winches. And it also is the opening of our fantasy, uh, dive into art fantasy featured exhibit, which will be open from January 19th to um, mid April. So uh, Jill and for your time, the History of Diving Museum would like to thank you and give you a one-year membership so that hopefully you can come down to the Florida Keys and um, see the exhibits and, uh, and visit. We're open 362 days a year, so hopefully some of that time you can take a break from your expeditions and play in the tropics. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> So, and again, if you uh, give us your email address again, if anybody wants to send you a uh, question. Sure. Yeah, intotheplanet.com is the website. You can just hit the contact there. Yeah. All right. Good night, everybody. This will be recorded and up on YouTube for further viewing. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye. <laughs> Say bye. 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 <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right. Say bye-bye. Bye. -bye, bye.